Episode two of our new segment, The Bible Versus Fundamentalists. Last week on the first episode of the segment, we covered immigration. And today we are going to cover an equally important topic, one that the Bible, especially the New Testament, has an incredibly large amount to say about, and that is poverty. Now, this is something that Jesus cared quite a bit about. You might not know that to listen to many Christian fundamentalists in the country, but Jesus did care about the poor just a little bit. And so we're going to read some of what the Bible actually says about poverty and then talk about what Christian fundamentalists in this country say and do in their politics when it comes to the poor. So first of all, this is coming from Matthew 19, 24. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That is perhaps one of my favorite quotes from the Bible, and I love the way that Christian fundamentalists, and in particular uh, strong capitalist Republicans, will try to twist themselves in knots to explain away this comment, saying, oh, it's the name of a gate in Jerusalem, and it's just kind of hard to get through it, but a rich man certainly could. Not so much. Um, next, let's see, this is coming from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus tells the rich man, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Again, direct instructions coming from a man that Christians purport to love and follow and respect. He's giving you very specific instructions about what to do. Get rid of your excess wealth, help out the poor, and you will be re re rewarded in the afterlife. Finally, or actually not finally, but moving on, we have the, the story of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is a beggar. Uh, he waits outside of a rich man's house every day begging for scraps. Now, finally, in the future, both Lazarus and the rich man die. Lazarus ends up in heaven while the rich man ends up in hell. When the rich man then begs for water, Abraham says, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And this is coming from Luke 19.25. And I love that story because it shows, like, you can do what you want in the, in, in, you know, your lifetime. You can exploit financial loopholes, you can pay low taxes and all that, and you can amass a ma uh, fabulous wealth, but that does not guarantee that things are going to go over well for you in the afterlife. Moving on, Leviticus 25.35, If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. And so, again, going back to the immigration angle, strangers and sojourners should be taken care of by good Christians. But even, you know, whoever it is, if they become poor, if they become destitute, it is your responsibility as a good Christian to take care of that person. So, again, coming out of Leviticus, which, by the way, has a lot of terrible things to say here, saying the right thing. Now, let's move on to Proverbs, because this is perhaps the section of the Bible that has the most to say about poverty, and I love what it has to say. Uh, 28.6 in Proverbs, Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. And what I love about that is if you are familiar with political Calvinism, uh, many Christians in America, and it's, it's made its way into basically every form of Christianity we have in America today, believe that wealth in this world indicates some sort of divine blessing. And God would not allow you to become rich if he did not love you. Um, there are some extremely wealthy, extremely violent drug uh, <laughs> tycoons, or I guess drug um, dictators in some ways in Latin America and South America. I don't know that that message would transcend over to there, but that's what they believe. Um, moving on again, Proverbs 29.7, A righteous man knows the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such knowledge. And I love it because we have this debate every single day in America when we fight over the budget, we fight over tax priorities and things like that, and the Democrats stand up for the poor and the middle class, and the Republicans stand up only for the rich and are willing to cut to the bone no matter what it takes cutting for the poor if it gives the rich a little bit more. This uh, section of Proverbs is directly addressing that. Now finally, Proverbs 17.5, Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. And there, we're moving a little bit away from the politicians, perhaps, and over to the pundits. People like Sean Hannity, people like, uh, to some extent, Ducey, but certainly Rush Limbaugh and people like that. They love to make fun of the poor as being lazy and deserving their status and things like that. And this section of Proverbs is particularly saying that you will not go unpunished if you mock those people. 
So as always, the purpose of this segment is to show what the Bible actually says, because Christian fundamentalists believe they have a divine blueprint, a divine plan, a divine manual as to how to conduct yourself in this world. And we're showing them that the way that they're living and the way that they're governing does not in any way comport with what the Bible says they should do. Now, we understand that in many ways, uh, particularly conservative Christian fundamentalists are using the Bible to reinforce what they already believe about gays and about women and about the poor, and they're using it to prop up their own strength and their own economic success and things like that. But look, if you actually read the Bible, particularly the New Testament, and particularly the words of Jesus Christ himself, you cannot believe and you cannot do the things that they do every day in this country.